checked in your spirit because you become God's done a work inside your mind and a work inside your spirit. And you're going to work inside your mind and a work. And so I really feel like God is going to work to change your mind and work. And so I really feel like God is going to work. Thank you, Father, on the open and heaven. I really feel like God is going to work. Thank you, Father, on the open and heaven. I really feel like God is going to work. Thank you, Father, on the open and heaven. Holy Spirit, we want you to invade us. We want you to invade us. Thank you, Father. Why don't you just come to the front right now? Just come to the front and start to feel that stirring of the Spirit. Thank you, Lord. It's opening up right now. I can see. It's thank you, Father. It's like a, a vortex. And it's opening, opening, opening. I decree and declare, open heavens in this place. And I decree and declare, a move your spirit, God, in this place. Let it start in us, Father. Let it start in us. A move of your spirit, God. We are hungry. We are thirsty for you, God. Thank you, Father, for the angels to come right now. We welcome the angels to come and worship you. Holy Father, alongside us, God, worshiping you, worshiping you, worshiping you. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, come, turn up in this place. And we don't care what it looks like, God. We just want you. We don't care what it looks like. We don't even care how we manifest, God. We just want you, Lord. Holy Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, why don't you just come and give yourself to Him. Yield to yourself in worship tonight. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Holy fire, pour out in this place. Oh,
Death is beating, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is the Lord. Empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Sing it out, Jesus is the
sing it out one more time. I know you got it. Sing it out. There is power, power, working power in the world. There is power, power, wonder working power in the presses.
keep celebrating because I really feel like He wants to teach us what it means to, you know, sometimes we focus on the death. I've got to die to stuff. I've got to die to stuff. No, He already made a way. You don't even have to die. You just have to go with them and be resurrected and live the life that He planned for you to live, that unison with God.
Let that flood begin to overflow in this way. I want you to just begin to sing in your own words. Just begin to lift worship up in this place. Thank you for your amazing grace. Your amazing grace. Your amazing
come on, you just lift that up. Just begin to praise him for his amazing grace. Up that highest praise tonight. Give him the highest praise. We give you give him the highest praise. Give him the highest praise. praise. Oh, we give you the highest. Give him the highest praise. The highest give praise. him the highest praise. Oh. Give him the highest praise. Come on, let it go. Don't just get lost in his presence tonight. <laughs> Father, we just get lost in your glory. <laughs> you know, it's moments like these. Oh, Jesus. You know, sometimes when you're like in, the, in that fleshly place, I don't know if you ever get this, but you can kind of think about heaven and what am I going to be doing in heaven and but I got so much to do on earth and I like what I'm doing on earth and I like earth but I tell you what moments like these that we're beginning to even just to, to have a taste of the ecstasy of the bliss of enjoying our father Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we get there that day? But yet Jesus said, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come on, heaven is beginning to invade this place tonight. We don't have to wait until we get there. Come on, why don't you just lift your hands, just begin to enjoy your Father tonight. Father, we just enjoy your presence. We enjoy the bliss, the ecstasy of knowing you.
you just begin to pour out heaven. Pour out heaven to the Oh, come on. <laughs> Heaven is invading this place. I believe that there's an opportunity to begin to even step into the very throne room of God. <laughs> then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing inside on the outside of the scroll. It was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals on the scroll and open it. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah the heir to David's throne has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked as though it had been slaughtered, but it was standing between the throne and the four living creatures among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes which represent the seven false spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forwards and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each who held a harp and held gold bowls before it, filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words, You are worthy to take the scroll and break it, seals and open it, for you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed many for God. From every tribe and every language and people and nation, you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God and they will reign in the earth. And I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne room of God and the living beings and the elders and they sang a mighty chorus worthy as the Lamb who was slain to receive power and glory and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and earth 
and under the earth, saying blessing and honor and glory and power to him who sits on the throne forever and ever and ever. Thank you, Lord, that you are in our midst, that you are enthroned in our praises. What an 
just tell him how much you love him. Daddy, we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. see this picture of the father is just, just enjoying his kids. Come on, just, just tell him. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be eloquent. We just love you. We just love you. the father saying some of you look so serious some of you just need to fall in love again come on why don't you just come on who wants to just fall in love again That's what you, the angel of the Lord, when speaking to the church of Lysiodea, says you've lost your first love. Come back. Come back. Come back to your first love. Come on, when do we just return to the first love? Whatever is come in the way of that first love, well, Lord, we just leave that behind. first love, if that's you, why don't you just come to the altar for a couple more minutes? that simple. feel people's hearts being set on fire with his love. I can literally feel a heat in my chest. And I just release that. He's burning love. He's burning love. He's burning love. He's burning love. Feel that fire. Let him ignite your heart. 
I tell you, he's doing something. He's doing something. He's doing something. In the meeting last night, we were singing the very same song, and I read from Revelations the very words that they're singing in heaven, even about who is worthy. The Lamb is worthy to open the scroll. We read that out as we were singing that song last night. And I said, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And he said, I want to merge my heart with yours. He is merging heart. And he is merging the realms of heaven and earth. And it's all for love. And it's all out of love. Let him burn. Holy Spirit, burn. We want to be on fire for you. And we want to be merged with your heart. Our heart and your heart, Father. We release that realm, Lord. One in the Spirit. One in the heavens, Father. Burning, burning, burning. We want to feel that heat. We want to feel that fire. Sure, God, of our son. Is anyone feeling that heat right now around their heart or their chest? Sure, of our sin that I just Open up your heart. Open up your heart. Let me open up. I am making with love for you. Come 
Come on, you open up your heart. As wide as it can open. Everything, 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 Dad. I just so love your presence. Why don't you go ahead and just take the hand of the person next to you, just all across this place. Father, I'm just praying right now. That we would be bonded together in such a unity and brotherly, sisterly love. The world will know that you're my disciples because you love one another. <laughs> Father, I thank you that we have encountered your heart. You know, we know that you love us. Father, even right now, begin to deepen that revelation. Deepen it, deepen. As in Ephesians 3, 17, how high, how wide, how far is the love of Christ. That all saints may know, even though it's far too big for us to, uh, to comprehend right now, he's just pouring out a revelation of his incredible love. You could spend the rest of your life just on the revelation of his love, digging, digging deeper and deeper, and you wouldn't even begin to touch at 1% of his heart for you. He loves you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you outrageously. And Father, right now I just pray that our hearts, as our hearts are beginning to be filled with the revelation knowledge of your love for us that we in turn <laughs> will love you back even far more than we have ever loved you before we love him because he first loved us he actually has given us the very capacity to love him back it's not something that we have to conjure up and Father, I pray that in this place that there would be like damn walls that would come down in people's hearts that we would love more than we have loved be before, Lord God. But in your commandment, Jesus said, if you love me, that you'll keep my commandments. What is his commandment? That we would love one another. Let this be a place where broken people can come in and that we'll feel love and acceptance, outrageous, outrageous love right now. God is beginning to unlock areas in people's hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just for a couple of minutes, why don't you just grow, just break off into groups of uh, maybe, let's say, three or four. And I want you just to begin to pray for one another. I know this is a, a church where we, we like to practice spiritual gifts, and we love that. But what I want you to do is to tap deeply into God's love. Just begin to pray. Begin to see that person that is beside you and that's in front of you, the way that Jesus sees and how much he outrageously loves them.
just all over this place also. If you're sitting around the back, um, I want to encourage you just to grab a, a, gr grab a couple people. Just begin to pray with them. I tell you what, this is just such a, such a precious moment. saw it before like fire, streaks of fire coming down and wrapping around like a vortex around people's arms and overcoming their bodies. You're releasing burning, burning love. So when the love of God gets on you, you're on fire. You are on fire. And everyone around you gets on fire. And it's like wildfire. So I release it now. Burning love, burning love, burning love, burning love. I decree and declare burning love to burn up in this place. Jesus! God is outside of time and this is what he's praying for us right now, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent them. I have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. We were just seeing his glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Jesus says, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they, the people at glory gathering, know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Thank you, Lord God, that you are here today and that you are in us and that we are in you and that you have come so that we may have unity, that the world may know that you are the one true God, Yeshua Mashiach. We acknowledge.
acknowledge you today. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you go ahead and hug on somebody? It may not be in your culture, but uh, it sure is fun. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Mm. Just give it a go. Just, just like outrageously love on somebody. Just... Just, just step outside your comfort zone. Say that encouraging word that you thought in your mind, but you thought it was a little too outrageous to say. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. This is your first time to our church. If you just lift your hand so that we can just welcome you, um, just lift it up if you can hear me. And this is your first time. We just want to. We certainly hope that you feel welcome. Thank you, Father. I just got a quick uh, word from our our very own Pastor Catherine, who is in England, and uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and play that. Actually, can we just? Yep. Go ahead. What an outrageous time in the presence. Of, can, um, Tom, if you could just switch the four, three to four. Hello, on the um, on the blue thing. Thank you, Jesus. Are you having a fun time? <laughs> if you haven't had a hug from Peter yet, make sure that you avail yourself to that. some snow the other day up uh, in Manchester. We had a wonderful meeting up there. A lady with a deaf ear got her hearing back, which was just so good. God is so good. And I'm um, here now actually in a monastery, Benedictine monastery, having a retreat with the apostolic leaders of Salt and Light in the south of England, and uh, which has been really wonderful. And then I'm heading to Basingstoke this weekend, then to Carnarvon, no, to Walsall, Len Carnarvon in Wales and Oxford for a fairly busy schedule, but I'm expecting God to do really wonderful things. So thank you so much for your prayers. I hear that the opening of uh, Sunshine Coast Glory City Church went really well last week, and I know that Joel and the team are doing a wonderful job looking after you all, and you're taking care of my husband. And uh, they said the building's looking really good, so I can't wait to come back and see. Uh, the progress and see what's been done. My heart is with you. I love you all. I'm watching the live stream and just enjoying what God's doing. Thank you for your prayers and I pray for God's blessing to be on you this weekend and that you have a glorious time in God's presence. I'm so proud of you all, the way that you're stepping up and just releasing the kingdom of God and hearing the stories about how God is just moving out on the streets and in the workplaces. So. Keep it up, keep loving people because uh, you're getting known by your love and I'm so happy that God is really answering our prayer that by this shall all men know that we are his disciples. We want to be known as a church that loves and you really are. And I appreciate all your love and prayers and your support while I'm over here. God bless you and I can't wait to see you again really soon. Well, I we give uh, Pastor Catherine a big hand. I'm sorry at some point she'll be watching the live stream. And so make sure that you continue to lift up her in, in prayers. I could hear some of the intercessory people praying against that guy in the background. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> um, if you want to make sure that, uh, that you're posting on the Facebook uh, page, I'm just going to really transition really quick. There's just such a sweet presence of God in the house tonight. Amen. And uh, I honestly feel like I'm, I'm just starting to <laughs> I'm just fall in love with him again. Tuesday night prayer. 7 p.m., come along and be a part of that. Uh, Thursday, nine, Thursday night at 7 p.m., the outreach. These guys are always have having an outrageous outreach time. So tomorrow we got uh, our outbreak launch uh, for the year, which is going to be so exciting. Um, we're going to 
come and be a part of that. Also on Sunday night, we've got, got our very own Joey, and I'm sure you've you heard him preach up a storm on Sunday <laughs> and call out words of knowledge and pray for people and see them slain in the Spirit. Uh, and he's going to be baptized in South Bank um, on Sunday night. So if you want to come and be a part of that. Uh, in a couple, probably a week and a half, we're going to be closing our, our Glory School of the Supernatural, um, which is going to be really exciting. We've got to, I tell you what, we have, we have an amazing intake. I, I want to get a sign on top of that a building out there that says, this is where revivalists are made. So that's going to be awesome. Here's a little word from our very own Joel Power, just with the Sunshine Coast. And um, yeah, they, they had a tremendous time on Sunday. And I'm going to let him talk about it right after he talks about it. Uh, this is our activation service. It's uh, 9.30 here this morning. I haven't quite started just yet. I think we're on glory gathering time, so, uh, so just pray for us and Sarah and I up here with all the leaders. We're going to do some incredible things. Uh, this morning is our activation service, and so after this service, we're going to move our coffee club to, to really do evangelism and do some coffee time. And, and tonight we're doing our celebration service at 6 p.m. So keep us in prayer. It's one big family being extended now, and uh, just think of us today as we're up here, and I pray that many of you come up and join us, and it's going to be an exciting time. And, uh, the people up here are just expecting God to do something incredible, and uh, it's beyond one person, it's beyond a team, it's, it's really a community of people, yeah, it's, a, it's a, pe- a community of people who just want to celebrate the goodness of God. What's our goal up here? Uh, simply to love God and love people. Uh, I think it's always going to be our goal. And so just pray with us, believe with us, uh, you know, this is the first stage of many stages, and uh, we believe the harvest is right up here, and we're not here to, to take away from anything, but we're here to add to what's already been accomplished up here, and so continue to think of us, people are coming in, it's our first service, it's really exciting, and uh, God's going to do some amazing things, we look forward to seeing you soon, bless you. It was an awesome time, can we say amen for that? I spilled water on my area, so forgive me. <laughs> I feel like I should stand around here like this when I talk to you guys. <laughs> I apologize, but we had an awesome launch on Sunday morning, and uh, and we did it at Sunday night. It was, it was amazing that little place there. We uh, it was just it was it was standing room only. <laughs> it was incredible, and uh, we didn't think that uh, we'd have that. I was quite happy. I, I met with the leaders up there on Saturday night. I was like, oh, that's good. We got 12 leaders. So the good thing about tomorrow, Sarah, is that we know that we're going to have a definite 12 people. <laughs> and uh, but we God just did so many great things and and then what the the, the good thing I love about um, what we're doing up there and about what we're doing here is that um, when you're leading something it's never it's never numerical numbers that you get excited about it but it's the influence that you can have on culture and uh, and so leadership isn't based on numerics it's, it's basically based on influence and so uh, being up there an extension from here uh, when you guys are worshiping we're preparing up on the Sunshine Coast for what God is going to do that night and and Sunday night was just amazing, and people were just coming uh, forward to the Lord. One guy got healed, and I love when people get healed because it always should point them to Jesus, right? He gets healed. Uh, I get this call on Wednesday from his brother-in-law. He ne- hasn't been to a church like that for ages, for about 10 years. Uh, he comes a bit skeptical, comes down the front. We pray for him. Uh, he gets healed. He's, he's never slept before for the last 15 years. He has to take pills at night, and he only has limited sleep. Uh, his wife had to wake him up on Monday morning because he was sleeping like a baby. And he has been sleeping like the baby for the last six days. And uh, so I'm quite excited. Sorry, five days because it's only Monday. But I'm quite excited because he, the first reaction I said to his brother-in-law today, what does he say? What is he saying about the service? He goes, he just wants more of God. And I was like, yes. <laughs> it's not about more of the pastor's hand, but just more of God. And, uh, and if, if that happens to people, I don't care what church they go to as long as they exp- experience Jesus. Amen. Can someone say amen? Because the harvest is plenty and, and, and the laborers are few, but there's a few laborers here that's going to get all the, the harvest in. Amen. Can someone say amen to that? So we're going to receive tonight's offering. We're going to be really quick because we have the honor and the privilege to uh, have Pastor Gareth. Can everyone say woo? And I must say he is single and he's amazing. And... Uh, I looked at Gareth when he came in tonight and I said, mate, there's only two things to dress up for. One is a girl and one for church. I'm just kidding. But uh, it's just exciting and uh, he's going to preach amazing tonight. And I'm really expecting from, I, I almost, uh, I think every time I think of Gareth, um, I think of uh, Graham Cook. We're not going to pass the buckets around just yet. I just want to pray for you first. So Lord, we just thank you. That's all right. If you give by credit cards, just lift your hands up. We want to 
uh, honor that if that's the way in the system. There's hands up here. So we'll just allow some people some time. There's three or four hands there. If we can do that, that'll be great. And four hands. Just keep your hand up, guys, until people come around. But I'm really praying that 2013 is the year of stepping into fulfillment what God has for you. Amen? Can someone say amen? I'm not trying to pump you up. I'm trying to get you into the zone where Jesus thinks. And he says, if I said it can be done, it'll be done. And so I want to encourage you tonight as you give, as you sow. Colossians 3.23 has been plaguing my mind this week. And it says, do everything unto the Lord wholeheartedly. And, and tonight, I didn't want to just prepare something small and, and just run down the shop and just chuck anything into the offering. I, I prepared in my heart. I rang my wife and said, this is what we're going to do. And, and so I want to partner because as we sow into the ministry of what Jesus is doing here, you don't understand. The blessing of it is that I get to go to the Sunshine Coast and start, we starting a, a Glory City Church there. And 200 people on Sunday got blessed with Jesus. Amen? Can someone say amen? And it's just what God is doing is just amazing. So let's... It's just hold you. See, when you stand up, we're gonna, the, the buckets will come around in a sec, but I just want to pray for you. If you've been believing for God for a breakthrough this year, um, it's, this year is your year. And I don't want to say that lightly, but just know the character of God. Because when He says something, it will always come to pass. We don't know the time. We don't know how it's going to happen. That's why it says seed, time, and harvest. The, awkward, the third person to the date on seed and harvest is always time. We don't know how long it's going to take between those two differences. But we know as we can be steadfast in what God has called us to do and live a generous life under Him, not for, for building projects, not for anything like that, but just to honor Jesus. Uh, I know that harvest is going to come. So God, we pray right now, we declare favor. We declare favor. Everyone say favor. We declare increase. Come on, say increase. We declare increase, expansion, in, in not just supernatural ways, but in, in the physical. Joel 2 talks about that. The whole earth will experience the Spirit of God. But it also says about 14 verses before that, that there'll be a, a physical blessing as well. And so God, we thank you for the manifestation of the things that we've been waiting for a long time to come to pass. And we declare tonight, we sow a seed of faith, God, for what you're about to do in our life, in our church, in our community, in our city. And someone say amen for what you're going to do in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray amen. So the offering buckets are going to come past. And uh, we'll just allow it to go past. And we're going to have, we're going to do it on Sunday now, Roland, if that's okay. And, and uh, we'll just wait for a few moments. God is so good. Uh, but I want to tell you, it was a real blast, i got to admit. Um, we're doing what we call activation service on Sunday morning. And so Sunday morning goes for one hour. And uh, so we kick off at 9.30, finish at 10.30. And activation service means we're activating people to hear from God and we're going to go on the streets. And uh, so Sarah and I decided to spend the whole month of January just talking about vision and what it is to be activated. And then in February, and uh, Joel Shaw's coming up on the weekend of Australia weekend, straight out weekend, and he's going to be ministering and we're going out in force. So I look forward to it. And Sunday nights up there, when we refer to celebration, we call it celebration night because we have all sorts of people from different churches come and and it's going to be quite amazing. I know Bruce Lindley is coming up in a couple of weeks to preach on that service. And yeah, it's going to be a good time with family. And so uh, can we stand? Because I will always want to honor the servant of God that ministers tonight. And, and I've been really waiting to hear what God has to say through this man. I, I know when he comes over to my house, he speaks so much depth. And, um, and he ministers so well to my wife and I as, as not only a dear friend, uh, but as a minister of the gospel. And it's a privilege tonight that we welcome Gareth Barnes to come and preach. Amen. Thanks, Gareth. Unmute this. Is that coming through? Yeah, we're online. Come on. I love that you applaud. And I haven't even, you don't even know what I'm speaking about tonight. That's like faith. <laughs> Just have a faith. Come on, Daddy. Oh, I love you, Josh. You're awesome, bro. Thank you so much. Wow, 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 wow. It is such an honor. Hmm. Thank you, Daddy. Let's just, uh, let's just give us some prayer. Father, we stand before you, Daddy, as your kids and as your sons. <clears throat> we know you are the one when there was nothing, Father, when there, nothing existed, you spoke and everything came into being, God. There was nothing and everything came into being. The power of your word released life, Lord. And we avail ourselves that it is what you want to say tonight who you want us to become in you, everything you want to do, Father God. 
Release your word, Lord. Let it burn like fire in our hearts, oh God. Not for a night, not for a week, Father, but for the rest of our lives. Let it burn like wild fire in our lives, oh God. Come and do the thing that you want to do, Daddy. We love you. Amen. <clears throat> I love that my friend Lisa finishes off her prayers with, we love you, Jesus. That's just a cool little way of uh, ending it off. Amen, and we love you, Jesus. P.S. You can, um, for those of you who have the word, turn to Hebrews 12, verse 1. I just want to start off with that uh, text of Scripture. Therefore, we also... I'll give you a few seconds. This is still turning there. <laughs> you can turn it pretty quickly on the iPhone, so I just uh, thought you guys would be there. Hebrews 12, verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Whoops. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. <clears throat> there are two things that I've wanted all of my life uh, for probably the better part of 25 years, I suppose, maybe when I was 8 or 10 onwards. Just two things that I've wanted. And if any part in my life, at any time in my life, you had asked me, what do I really want? If I was honest in that moment, there would have been two things. Sometimes I may have forgotten about them, they may have been covered up by other stuff and busyness of life and in the moments of absolute clarity where I knew exactly. But basically, all the way through my life, there were just two things that I wanted more than anything, more than even friends, more than uh, success or wealth or what have you, marriage and things, just two things that burned and still continue to burn. I, I don't know really why exactly. It just seems like it was just hardwired into me from, I don't know, maybe the moment I was saved or the uh, moment I was born, it's just there. You know, some things you, you don't always know how they got there or what's happening. <clears throat> some people have dreams, I think, that are so big they don't even know why they are the ones dreaming that. When there are other people that seem more competent and more resourced, I'm like, why am I the one that's busy dreaming this, God? But there's a reason. I, um, I've been saved pretty much all of my life. When I was a young whippersnapper, I went to my mom and I said, Mother, I pray thee do tell. <laughs> when was I saved? What is the, the hour that I became a member of the household of faith? And uh, she said, well, you were young. You were just uh, knee-high to a grasshopper. And I was astonished that I could ever be knee-high to a grasshopper. <laughs> but I was young and uh, made a wise decision. By the grace of God, he called me into his bosom, into intimacy, into the kingdom. I know no other life, I know of no other context beyond that, beyond just talking and praying to God. I know no other context of doing life just, just knowing that God's there, not distant, not far away, not from a distance, but middle style, but in me and around me. Some of you know that song. <clears throat> I know no other context, and I'd hate to imagine any other context. And I can appreciate the joy that people have when they've been through hell literally and uh, figuratively and have you know as unsaved people and have come into the kingdom and now they get to experience what we've enjoyed for so long and you, it's no wonder that they shine like the stars that they're so gloriously blessed so the point being that saved pretty much all my life and most of that time there were just two things that I desired one was the voice of God and the second was the presence of God. There were times when I'd just be on my bed and just almost crying out for that. It was such a deep longing, such a deep hunger in my heart for the voice of God. Because I would speak to God and I would chat to Him and have lengthy discourses and just 
offloading of my heart, sharing hopes and sharing dreams and that. But I wanted that reciprocal conversation that you, that you have with God, that a lot of us are walking in now and that you hear about and I listen to ministers and preachers as they would go on about their conversations with God. And I had a, had a, a latte at the coffee club and I talked to Jesus and, and just got into that. I would, I would literally burn with jealousy. Everything in my being, everything would desire that. And it was a weird place to be where you know that the desire that's in you is also the desire in God, and you're moving towards that. A lot of you know that maybe in a different context with healing. You absolutely know unequivocally that it is God's will for you to be healed. You desire it, God desire it, desires it, and for a season you have to live in the tension between before you walk into that place, knowing you and God are wanting the same thing, and you are having to walk into that, walking through the proverbial valley, as it were. It's a strange tension. It's, a, it's an unusual place to be. When you know God who's omnipotent and omniscient and is burning with love for you, desires it, and you desire it. Sometimes you have to walk in that tension until you see that thing come to pass. <clears throat> His voice is really like nothing else that I could describe. And I know, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, you know, who you guys walk in such a wonderful intimacy with God. We all do. And on the streets, you know, just the words of knowledge that flow and things, it's just beautiful. We know that. We know these things. And it's nothing, it's like nothing else. And I'm sure many of you will testify that sometimes there are moments of... Um, special clarity, if I can call it that, where, you know, you can talk with God and chat with God, etc. And there are moments, though, when He talks and it's like it's a thunder pouring through your soul. It's a word of such power and magnitude. It's like it just rumbles through you and everything changes. And often it's not much. It may be a singular word, but it comes with all the force of God's being and His energy and His life and His love. And it's it's incredible. It's indescribable. And it's no wonder then when Jesus gets baptized in the Jordan by John, he comes up, heavens open, dove descends, and the Father speaks. This is my, my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. No wonder then that when he goes into the desert to get tempted by the, uh, I mean, not to get tempted, but just goes into the enemy. <laughs> he goes, oh, no, doesn't go to the enemy. He goes to the desert to pray and to fast. No wonder the enemy comes to tempt him because he knows the power of the voice of God speaking to somebody. Satan knows it. He's, he's seen it for six, 8,000 years, however long we've been here on the planet. He knows the power of the voice of God speaking into an individual, speaking to their heart, speaking life and purpose and breakthrough into them. He knows what it is. And so what does he do? There's, I guess the only logical thing that you would do he comes to sow doubt into that area where the word is spoken. And so he says, well, if you are the Son of God, a voice from heaven just came <laughs> confirming, this is my beloved Son whom I'm well pleased. And here the enemy is trying the same old trick they tried in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say not to eat? Thousands of years later, same thing, same strategy. It's just like, uh, talk about one track. That's just what he's on about. Because <clears throat> I feel like there's a gestation period between God speaking a word to you and that thing coming to pass. And that's the tension that you have to walk in the middle. And especially in a prophetic culture like this, you know, you can get three prophetic words before you get out of bed in the morning. People SMSing you, emailing, Facebooking. It's like, woo! You know, it's not hard to know what the will of God is for you. It's awesome. I'm not downplaying it. I love it. I love prophetic words. I love being able to give them, I love being able to receive them. Um, so it's not like God's not speaking. It's not like, we're not, it's not like we're deaf to not hear Him. But there is that journey, that gestation, if you will, of Him speaking the Word and coming to pass. Um, and, and, and again, like I mentioned, His voice and His presence. It's His two elements that just get me every time. Every time, his presence and his voice. So much so, we can see it with Moses as well, where God says to him, Moses, um, take the people and go over yonder, wherever 
yonder was. And Moses says to God, no. Who would say to God, no? Really? He says, no, I'm not going to do that. There was a proviso. He was like, well, we won't go unless your presence goes with us. We are, I'll be happy to go. Your presence must go with us. Interesting thing that Moses said, he said, unless your presence actually goes with us and accompanies us, how will we be different from all the other nations on the earth? Without your presence, we are simply a herd of people <laughs> moving from one place to the other. Who knows if we'll even make it to the other side? Without the distinguishing element of your presence, we are simply a people, simply a flock without a shepherd herding through the earth. And so it was a good no. I think God liked that no. Um... The prophetic, uh, Corinthians talks about the prophetic being there to uh, edify and encourage and exhort you. And we know that. We drink of that often here. In almost every service, there'll be ministry time. Might do it again tonight. Might have a fire tunnel. We'll see what happens. Um, we know what that's like. <clears throat> but I wanted to say something that I don't hear said much here, but I think it needs saying. Um, can I quickly use you, Joel, as an example? I won't embarrass you. Sometimes that happens in this church. I like to call people up. <laughs> we just face up. So let's say I'm a general of an army, and Joel's um, one of my finest soldiers. He's about to go out to battle. He hasn't got anything on yet. He's got clothes on, but he hasn't got armor on. So let's just say, you know, we've got... Um, we're putting the breastplate of righteousness, to use the biblical example. Ephesians got the helmet of salvation on him. Got his awesome shoulder pads covering him. Got a, a back plate of glory. The word says that the glory of God is my rear guard. We got the uh, belt of truth. We got the sword of the spirit. We got the shield of faith. And we got the, the, uh, the shoes of the gospel of peace on him. And he's already, he's about a guy. He's never been into battle yet. You know, he's watched the DVDs. You know, he's heard <laughs> stories. But he hasn't actually gone into the sweat and the blood of battle. And so I say to him as his commander and as his trainer, Joel, when you go out there into the field and these herds, I keep saying herds tonight, um, these marauding troops of savages run at you, bloodthirsty for you, um, it's going to be amazing. You're going to love it. Uh, there'll be harps, there'll be cellos, there'll be tables of food. I've even set a hammock up for you. You're just going to love it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to wield your sword. Nothing like that. Cheers, thank you. <laughs> now, let's say I did all of that and I prepared him for battle. You know, I said, all right, go out, man. Get into it. It's going to be so sweet. It's going to be so lovely. It's going to be like, like finger painting for kindergarten kids, you know. Um, I know I've had many words that kind of give you the end result of what God's taking you into, you know. That may happen six months, two years, a couple of years later. So it gives you the end picture. It doesn't really always uh, describe the journey there necessarily, probably for good reason. Uh, it doesn't mention, you know, the backstabbing from people along the way. It doesn't mention the, the, the raw faith for finances you're going to have to stand on God for and come through. It just sort of mentions, there's the goal and run after it. Um, the Ephesians mandate for leadership, as part of the pastoral team here in the church, it would be remiss of us to not prepare you for the battle that's ahead and that you're even in now. The, the, the mandate in Ephesians I'm referring to is that uh, the fivefold ministry build people up into the unity of the faith and maturity, that you basically make people into complete whole people ready for war, ready for ministry, to do the will of the Lord. That's the thing. It's not to actually raise people to be dependent. There are people in ministries that I think probably do that. They, they want people to be at their feet, dependent on them like suckling babes, and never actually grow up, feeding on the need for dependency. That's not what we're about. That's not the Ephesians' mandate of the fivefold. It's to get you guys so radical and complete that you don't need me, you don't need Joel, 
in a way. Uh, I'm not talking about abandoning church and that. I just mean you're so complete that you then become a leader to somebody else. You know, you're making disciples. You become a disciple, become the leader, etc., etc. You become that. But it would be remiss of me to prepare you for a thing that you may encounter with a completely wrong expectation. And we see this throughout the Bible. You know, the, uh, the Pharisees and things had a certain picture of what Christ was going to look like on the earth, of what he was going to do, who he was going to become. You know, and, and Jesus gives a parable of, well, you played the, the flute at the, um, at the dirge, at the funeral thing, and you didn't dance, and we wept at the funeral, and you, you know, you, we played a sad song, you didn't weep, played a happy song, you didn't dance and jump around. We had an expectation of what you were going to be and do on the earth, and you're not that, and we're really confused, and we're quite ticked off as you can testify by the cross. They were really not happy <laughs> with that. That's in its extreme form. So, the epiphany that I felt God laid on me the other day was, um, I often ask Him why faith. <laughs> Maybe I just have to take it on faith, that it's faith. But I ask, like, why, why do you use faith? You know, He could have said, well... If you, um, you know, if you walk in, in, in joy, these things will happen. It's like faith is a currency in the kingdom of God, if that makes sense. It may be controversial for some. Perhaps there's several currencies. I'm not going to say that's the, the corner on the market. But it's almost like you exchange and engage in the kingdom and in the spiritual and the supernatural with faith. You know, when we're praying here for people, we're praying for things that are absolutely impossible in the supernatural. Uh, I mean, in the natural Totally possible in the, nat in the uh, supernatural. When Chris prayed for somebody at hospital, the blind eye, medicine was trying its best to basically re replace the entire eye, or just the cornea? Cornea, yeah. Replace the cornea, that was the best. He prayed something impossible in the natural, that God opened up his eye, 2020 perfect vision. These are transactions of faith, and it's important to know that. It's not wishy-washy, and it's important to know that because you need to guard your heart, obviously, as a son and a daughter of God. You need to guard that um, violently, for lack of a better word. You need to guard it jealously. The stuff in the media, the stuff that you take in, all of that stuff can go into your heart to the point that you may be praying, trying to pray healing on somebody, and all you're picturing is this you know, current affair documentary on how many viruses there are around the city and I'm not down in that per se but I'm saying it can affect your operation and faith you know Jesus said to the disciples because they were going in the boat to the other side and he made a comment and they thought oh we forgot the loaves of bread you know and Jesus is like no 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 have you forgotten the bread I multiplied last time it's like a l the lack of bread is not even the issue here problem is you've forgotten what I did only a short while ago and you let doubt creep back into your heart to such a degree that you've actually forgotten the testimonies of what God did and I am sure that everyone in this room has a testimony of God it may be a singular testimony there may be a thousand of them but I urge you to remember those testimonies because there is a world calling you to doubt calling you to fear and lock your doors and shut everything down and go to your room and just play the victim. And that is not the role that God has for us. He's made you a king on the earth. And you have to think and rule and believe like a king on the earth. It's an injustice to everything that he's done. He paid such a price on the cross for us to be, <sighs> to walk in such power on the earth, to walk in such blissful love. It seems like such an injustice to live anything less than that. The word says Jesus was anointed with joy above all of his brethren. Uh, I know it says he was acquainted with sorrows, and I think there were times for that where he looked out across the people and he was so grieved because he said they were like sheep without a shepherd. And as a father, the father heart of God in him would have grieved for that. But it also says he was anointed with joy above all of his brethren. So, getting back to the epiphany, for me, maybe common for you, you may have heard it a long time ago, 
I think sometimes a word comes at a particular moment and it's just the word you needed to hear. And you may have heard it a year ago, but to you now, it's like it's something else. It's revolutionary. The epiphany was faith, in order to be proven that it's true, must be tested. You can tell me that you love your wife. You can tell me a thousand times. But how will you and I know that you really love her, really solidly, unless that gets tested? I'm not even talking about like a test with adultery. It's not like you should be praying, <laughs> you know, welcoming that into your life or something. But there will be days maybe where you just, I don't know, couples have said sometimes I just, I just, the feeling's just not there or not there for a couple of hours. It comes back. That's all good. But, you know, maybe you just wake up tired and you're like, you know, whatever. You know, but that it, right there is even a test to say, all right, emotion's gone, emotion's out the window, it's all good, but what is your decision? What are you going to walk in when the emotion's been removed or a negative emotion's been replaced? What are you going to walk in that? Because uh, in Mark 4, I think it is, the parable of the sower. I love that parable. It's just so relevant to every single day because it happens every single day. The Word of God is sown into your heart and every single day, there is something trying to pull the Word of God out of your heart. There may be thoughts and mindsets that you've had for 20 years. You don't even realize that it's almost a, a mindset like a combine harvester that as the Word of God is sown into your heart, this thing just comes behind and just plows it up. And you keep thinking back to the experience that you had where you were disappointed, and that thing just pulls up that seed again and again and again. This is the reality. It may be subtle, and perhaps we don't always put our finger on it, but it's a reality. When that word is sown, the enemy will try to take it. Why? Because he knows what the voice of God is like in you. He knows that that thunder rattling through your soul will bring dead people back to life, will restore marriages, will make limbs grow. The enemy has been around long enough to see it. He knows what a well-harvested heart looks like. He's seen it in revival. He's seen hearts like uh, John Wesley. I think he said it. Get on fire for God and people will come to watch you burn. And every morning he'd do that. He'd get up and he'd wait on God for fire. And he would burn. But there is a discipline. There is a cultivation of that thing that needs to happen. This guy... I love what Joel Power does. There's an excellence about his life that is astonishing and it is such a blessing. You know, you see him and you see him smiling and happy and blessed and uh, Pastor Warren as well, another amazing example. You see a joy that's there. It didn't just happen one day. <clears throat> it, they didn't just, you know, fall out of their bed and put on a happy shirt in the morning and never took it off. There is a continual cultivation of prayer and the Word of God and declaration and proclamation and professing the promises of God, the Word of God, and they see something break and they see it happen. And they say, all right, this is a, an establishment in my life. And you see in the Old Testament, sometimes, sometimes when something amazing would happen, or there would be a unity between two families and they'll build a place of rocks as a testimony to say, this place, something happened. Both families will put rocks together and just build some. I don't know the dimensions of it, but it, it must be significant enough so they go away and come back and we're still there. Because they didn't want to forget what had happened. They didn't want to forget. And each, each milestone that's covered should be creating, I believe, in us a momentum. But God's saying, you know, it's a funny thing to me. When people say, because I've said it, and that's probably what it's funny to me. Um... I have faith for this, but not so much for this one, you know. I have faith that God will give me a car. Mm, not so much he raised dead people, do you mean? Whatever the, whatever the example is. That's extreme, but, you know, it's an example. Just roll with me. <laughs> um, it's just funny because it's the same God that's doing all of it. Do you think it's weird? I mean, you, you, we're saying that because um, my experiences, I prayed for a car and God gave it to me. So there's a milestone. There's a milestone that's been done, and God did it, and here we are. I haven't prayed for a dead person yet or seen them come to life, so, mm, you know, but this one's good. 
this one, I'm working on it, you know. And it's this journey. But I'm like, why do we put barriers around the faith that we have in God? If He's God, isn't He God always? Isn't He God everywhere, through every generation, morning, noon, and night, Monday to Sunday? Isn't He God? Even if you haven't experienced that part of God, is He not still God? We reduce the perception of God down to these, these anemic pictures of what we've experienced, or what we've heard, or what we've read, and we reduce a fierce and an awesome God down to this belittled, pathetic picture sometimes of who we think He is. And our prayers reflect that. And it, it is so sad, and I know I've prayed that, I, and God showed me that sometimes, and I've stood out of it, and I said, what sort of a prayer is that, you know? <laughs> who said that? <laughs> it's like, but that's not Jesus. He is the desire of the nations. Everybody wants a king like Jesus. They may not know who he is. All they may know is the stink of religion. But everybody, if they look into the eyes of Jesus, every single human will burn with desire for who he is. Just a thought. Meditate on it. Faith needs to be tested in order for it to be real. So, I guess the question is, when a trial comes, what's our response? As sons, as daughters, living in the kindness and the love of God, what's our response? Because um, we're full of faith here, as we should be, and we've had an amazing worship, as the worship team did an amazing job tonight. Incredible job. <laughs> loved it, loved it, loved it. So good. You know, and, and our hearts are stirring and we're full of love. And, and, and it's like we've seen this picture again of who Jesus is. We've been reawakened, we've been reminded. I mean, sometimes it's just reminding. You just forget sometimes from Monday to Thursday, you know, whenever you come to church. You just forget these things sometimes. And your boss says this and this happens. And again, we cast our minds back to these things sometimes of tensions and frustrations. I mean, I remember coming out of a tricky season of about six months after a breakup where my, my view of God was so diminished. It was like Swiss cheese. It just had these holes all through where the faith used to be solid like titanium, except heavier, but it was just Swiss cheese, you know. And I could feel it in the worship and I'd come to God and I'd, I'd try and worship and, and eventually I'm like, why am I not giving you the worship that I know you deserve? You are a blazing fire of love, and you deserve my highest worship. Why am I not giving that to you? And I sat down and just talked to him. And he was like, well, you're disappointed in me, Gareth. You thought I was going to do something, and I didn't. And it, it, it really shattered your heart. And so you disappointed in me. And it was. It was real. It was true. I, I let that thing happen. I let that thing grow. So, um, so it affected the worship, it affected the offering of what I'd bring to God when I'd proclaim Him as Lord and King and majestic and beautiful. And expectation, and that's come up a lot lately, especially as you come into the new year and you're believing for things and you're putting 2012 way behind you and you're stepping into 2013. There's always a sense of expectation, isn't there? People do up their, their goals for 2013 because they, they, there is hope in them that this year will somehow be different to the year before. And I love that about the human spirit. I love that about the, the, the DNA of God in us. We hope that tomorrow can be better than today. That if I reach for something higher tomorrow, I can reach and I can go after it. Um, Jeremiah was having a particular whinge session with God in the book of Jeremiah. And he was like, oh, these people, you know, you've called me as a prophet. You know, even before I was born in the womb, you know, you ordained me as a prophet, blah, blah, blah. So I'm here, and I'm being a prophet, and I'm prophesying left, right, and center, and I'm lying on the side and eating off dung and doing all these things, you know. And the people, their foreheads are like flint. They're not listening to what I'm saying. And I know it's your word because I can hear your voice. And I'm speaking, and I'm not seeing any change in the people. And God's response was rather interesting. It wasn't... Um, what you might expect. He says, Jeremiah, 
If you have run with a footman and they have tired you out, how then can you run with the horses in the plain of Jordan? It's a heavy one. Just sell out over that. Jeremiah's like, whinge, whinge, whinge. God's like, dude, you're running with a footman and you're basically finished. I'm, I'm basically, I'm calling you on to run with the horses. Isn't that awesome? I'm calling you on to run with the horses in the plain of Jordan. And you're not even making it through this. And it's pretty intense, but uh, obviously Jerry could take it. You know, God, God's awesome. He knows exactly what to say to anybody at any time. He, he's, he's good that way. But um, <clears throat> it made me just appreciate again the need for faith to be tested. And what do you do when you're there? You know, and, and uh, some of you would be, would be, have been there or maybe still there sometimes. You know, you, it's 3 a.m. and you're sitting on the corner of your bed and your legs shaking and you're sweating, not from the heat, but from fear. And there's things gripping your mind and you're wondering how you're going to pay that mortgage. And you're wondering if your child's ever going to get healed. And things are gripping your heart one finger, one vice grip at a time, you know. What do you do with that sort of attention to live in? Knowing still in the midst of that, that God is God. That somehow in the midst of all of this calamity, He is who He says He is. How do you live in the tension of that? <clears throat> 1 Samuel 30. has something rather interesting on this uh, matter. 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse 1. I find it interesting that Jesus says of himself he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Because he said when he was on the earth, he said, when I, the Son of Man, come back to the earth, will I find faith on the earth? Interesting that he chose that, isn't it? He's like, you know, I'm not going to find a fire tunnel on earth. I'm not going to find joy and woo parties, you know. He's like, Will I find in my bride, who I shed my blood for, will I find faith on the earth when I come back? <clears throat> now, in uh, 1 Samuel 30, and I believe that this is a key, and I'll be, be bringing this into a close. I think it's a key for many people. I do believe that leaders who have stood the distance and gone, stood their ground and gone the distance, uh, do this. They've learned how to do this well, what we're about to discover in 1 Samuel 30. They've done it well, they've done it consistently, they've done it year after year, and trial after trial. 1 Samuel 30 verse 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and attacked Ziklag and burnt it with fire. So Ziklag was the city that they lived in, with the men, their wives, with their children, and had taken captive the women and those who were there. From small to great, they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and, and this is after they fought. I mean, they've gone out and they fought, and so they've come back battle-weary, you know, some probably bleeding, thirsty, hungry, just wanting some sweet home-cooked meals, you know, just some, some sweet TLC from the missus and just to uh, put the feet up, turn on the plasma and just relax a bit, you know. Then David and the people, um, so yeah, David and his men came to the city and there it was burnt with fire and their wives, their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. So just picture the scene, you've come back battle-weary Everything in you is longing just to come home and just to be home and just let it all go and relax and be with the ones that you love. And it's one thing having disappointment. It's one thing being exhausted out of your mind and having disappointment. The, the reserve for that just it diminishes quickly. I know you know what I'm talking about. You know, fatigue is a, is a crazy thing. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had been taken captive. 
Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. But <clears throat> every man for his sons and his daughters. So the people were grieved, as David was, with his two wives taken. And then they start murmuring about, well, maybe we should stone David. You know, it's not like he was away fighting and emailed the enemies to say, please come and burn our city. You know, it's not like he invented this thing. You know, it's not like he did it. But again, fatigue and, uh, and sorrow do strange things to people, to the mob mentality. <clears throat> and this is the key. This is the whole point of me reading this chapter. The last part of verse 6. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So he inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, And pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. We can get a lot of encouragement. Um, sorry, I just want to have an eye on the time. Um, we can get a lot of encouragement from people, from lovers, from husbands and wives, and teaching and uh, YouTube clips of, of preaching. And we come to church and there's worship and there's CDs. I mean, there is a multitude of encouragement of the Word of God, of worship. You can feast 24-7 and download podcasts and things like that. However it is, whatever it is <clears throat> that you need to do, we need to be a people who can readily, and even at the drop of a hat, strengthen and encourage ourselves in the Lord. Because there may be moments where it is only you and God. You may be in another country, and maybe things fall apart, and you haven't got Friday night church, and you haven't got a whole group of people around you to lay hands on you and run through a fire tunnel and bless you. You yourself, you as an individual standing on the earth, need to know how to engage with God in such a way as presence comes and invades your soul, quickens you to life, and brings you out of that miry clay, as it were. And it's not something that needs to be reserved for an event. This is a lifestyle. There's no reason why you cannot encourage yourself every day in the Lord. I guess the thing um, sometimes is need though, isn't it? You know, when there's a need, it drives us often to prayer. Or sometimes crazy things, but hopefully at least prayer and God. And when that equation is removed, sometimes people's prayer life diminishes, you find. Which is an interesting thing that sometimes the success that we pray for is sometimes the biggest temptation, isn't it? Because the person who is needing God for a breakthrough may often come to church, get there early, greet the pastor, double tithe, uh, you know, look after their, 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 their wife so that their prayers aren't hindered with God and love on her and um, feed the neighbor's kitten when they're away and love on people. They may be doing all of these things because they need God for a breakthrough. And all of those things may look exactly like the person next door who's doing all of that because they are desperately in love with Jesus. The two actions can be exactly the same and from a very different place. And so you wonder when the person who is needing God for breakthrough gets the breakthrough and the success comes, what then drives them to seek God? Because if it is not love, then I don't know what it is. What else would drive a person to get up and engage with God and love on Him where he seemingly needs nothing? Where there's so much money in the bank account, all of his family is healthy and wealthy and wise and everything is good. What would drive that person to seek God? If it's not love, then you often just see that it dwindles and falls away. And that's a tension sometimes. Again, another tension of success that we have to walk through. I know when I came here uh, nearly 12 years ago to Australia from South Africa, and um, I'm quite a cuddly fellow. I, uh, one of my love languages is touch, so I love to just hang out with people, quality time, I love to engage with people, love to give hugs and receive hugs. 
you know, and I came here by myself, uh, no family, no mom and dad or brothers and sisters joined me at that stage. And uh, so I came here and in this awesome country with all this, these unusual accents around me, you know, and uh, using words like servo and g'day and stuff, and I'm like, ah, this is cool, I can roll with that. But, you know, it took a while to establish a friendship base. And so there would be nights where I'd be walking along saying, God, I am so longing for intimacy, not just with you, but with people, you know, and, and I didn't have a car at the time, and the church, um, uh, there's just an age thing, I guess, with the church, I wasn't really grooving quite with the, the group at that time, it just took a long time to establish that, but you know, I'm grateful for that, because there's so many nights where I had to walk around and say, Father, the only one who's going to satisfy my heart is you, the only one who's really going to put a, such a peace and a love in me that I can go to bed that night completely content and at ease is you. And that's true when you're not just lonely. I do know and believe and I've seen even people who are happily married, uh, successful in everything, but missing that intimacy, that God factor, still the heart of man is never designed ever to live outside of a burning intimacy with God. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm grateful for those times. I imagine some of you have had those times too where you've just, uh, it's just been you and Jesus, you know. There's nobody on the left, there's nobody on the right, there's nobody in front of you, there's nobody behind. It's just you and God. But I love the saying, it says, you and God make a majority. And it is so true. God came to Moses, appeared as a burning bush, and said, Moses, you and I, we have some work to do. We're going to go and deliver an entire nation from the most powerful nation on the earth. God didn't rally an army together. Didn't rally, you know, 300 people like Gideon's army. He just called one man. One man who had obviously uh, been trained 40 years on the backside of the desert herding animals. Somehow, I believe all of that two it created him and made him um, the perfect guy for the job you and God are majority I, I basically felt and I hope this has come through as that as an encouragement because we're starting a year that I believe is going to be like no other it's an amazing 2013 you, the, the, the expectation is palpable in the air it's going to be exquisite and uh, you see with any great people who have succeeded have had to walk through stuff. And I guess I just want to lay that down. Um, I mean, the thought, the other thought that came to me the other day, I had lunch in the forecourt at work, and just, just like out of nowhere, God just said to me, uh, who said it was going to be easy? You know, not referring to lunch, but just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I would have to kill this food and then eat it? What's going on here? Uh, who said it's going to be easy? And it really got me thinking because you get a word from God and it sounds like it's just simply going to fall into place. And there are times when that happens. I'm not trying to put doubt or fear into you. I'm trying to extract it out and get that out of you, you know. But there are, there are times when things happen and a word of God comes. And I know I've done this. So I sat back on my laurels and I said, all right, God, do it. I'm expected and I'm excited. So just do it, you know. And nothing has happened. And I've come back to God. And I've said, um... So, the word you gave me uh, was a good word. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to coming to pass. Is there anything I can help out with here? You know, and God's like, yeah, there sure is. You know, uh, for some of you, maybe a business. I know there's timing, so please hear me when I say this. There is a timing in God. Uh, where he may give you a word, but want you to do absolutely squat for six months. So, hear me in that. There is a, a balance of that, and that's that's the whole deal of walking in intimacy with God every day. Like, what, what is it today, Father? What's the steps? Steps of the righteous, the order of the Lord. But just saying that in the context of everything, <clears throat> when you go in, um, if it gets tricky, don't necessarily be surprised, I guess is what I'm wanting to put across. Don't let your heart be burdened. Because in the middle of that, you know, when, when you're a David looking at the Goliath, there's an amazing promotion on the other side of that for you. There is something so exquisite 
You need to get over that thing. You need to go through that. Sometimes you can't walk around the fire or helicopter over it. Sometimes you just have to walk through it. But it's good. It is so good because it refines and strips away all the rubbish, all the silly creeds that you believe in, all the rubbish philosophies and pseudo-pop psychology that some people cling to. It strips all that away because God is a consuming fire. He's a consuming fire and He loves us too much to let us walk around with His pots and pans of indifference and cheap theology and, uh, and greasy grace and half-truths that don't actually stand up in the fire. Right. Straw and grass do not make it through the fire. Right. Only what's been hardened. You know, and so many of the promises that God gives you is like a clay brick. You know, traditionally, they just get clay, make it, and then put it into the oven. And only after it's been in the oven is it good for use. Before that, it's just Play-Doh, you know. It's just good for kindergarten. And so the promises of God to you are in many ways like that clay. Um, they're good and they have the potential to build in an amazing house. To build something so beautiful and extravagant that the world will stop and look. But that promise will often, you, f you may find, you will find, will need to be put in the oven and be tested. That word in your own heart getting tested. Uh, Pastor Catherine often talks about the Joseph where it says the Word of God tested him like, like iron in his soul. It tested him. But he stood through it and he went through it and it became something beautiful. And he became a, even a typology of Christ. He became like a type of uh, Christ on the earth, a savior as it were to the nations as they put the silos up and, uh, and prepared the food, you know. I hope that makes sense. You guys getting something out of that? You know, it's a good year. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be extravagant. But I don't want you going in there not battle ready, not battle prepared in your mind and in your heart. It will be an injustice for me, be an injustice for God to send you into a place with a completely off expectation. So what do you do? What am, what am I saying how you should engage? Have all the optimistic uh, benevolence and joy in your heart that you can muster. I'm not saying go into something with intrepidation and uncertainty. You know, I'm not saying go in there with a, a hairy eyeball on the situation of what's going to happen. I mean, is everything going to fall apart? That's not even the question. Is everything going to fall apart? I mean, who do you think God is? There was nothing, and He spoke, and universes came into being. That's who He is. So don't go into something a bit intrepid. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if it looks, if it starts to fall apart, or it's waiting, staying, you know, if it's delaying longer than it should, you have permission to rejoice. Do first things first, and do what David did. Went back to the presence of God. Father, I need your voice, and I need your presence. Give me those two things. Come hell or high water. I will walk through this thing to the other side. If all the world falls away, give me your voice, give me your presence, and I will endure to the end, unequivocally, without any doubt at all. I will make it through to the other side. Give me your word. Give me something true that I can hold on to, and give me your presence. Wrap it around my heart, because I am your son. Let's pray. Wow, thank you, Father. You are awesome, God. You are so awesome, Daddy. And Lord, we're sorry for all the pictures of you we've painted of a small God, of a God unwilling to bring heaven to earth, God. Painted pictures of you, Father, marred and checkered by failure and confusion and frustration in the past, Father. You don't deserve our baggage putting you on that onto you father you are amazing just as you are good days bad days you are awesome father you are awesome in the sunshine and the rain in the winter and the summer lord you are awesome god and father i pray as we go from this place that you continue to paint on the uh the sistine chapel as it were of our heart god 
Paint the pictures of what you have for this year, Father. Paint them in such vibrant technicolor, in such 7.1 surround sound, Lord, that we know the will of God, Father. And it's so established in us, Lord God, that whatever happens, this is the word of God, and it will not return to you void, Father. You have spoken your word, and it shall not return to you until it is accomplished that for what you're to send forth to do, Daddy. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Well, I reckon we should have some fun. Hey, what do you guys reckon? Can we get the ministry team up? I um, just want to lay some love on some people. And uh, the worship was so good before, I think we should just jump into it a little bit more as well, you know, get into it. Um, you know, I'm not actually going to, I'm, the others might, I'm not going to personally call anybody up individually right now. I just want to put the offer there. There may be some of you who witnessed with what is said, with the journey, with the battle. Love to pray for you. Please come up. We want to just impart grace. The Bible says there can be an impartation of grace. Paul says, when I come to you, bam, I'm going to impart some grace to you. I want to lay some hands on you. I want to encourage you. But not just for an event. I really want this to be a lifestyle for us, guys. I want us to be people who know, like David, I went and I encouraged myself in the Lord. Not, on a, not just on a Friday or on a Sunday. I did it on a Wednesday when nobody was around. There was a well-worn path in my heart from here to the throne of God because I've walked it again and again and again. And He is so faithful. I'm going to come to Him again and I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. So come on up. We want to just love on you. Come on, Daddy. Come on, it is, it is. Wow, wow. And feel free just to um, just to minister as well, ministry team. If you want to call anybody up, just go for it.
Yeah. 